Welcome to the Emerald City Hockey Podcast. Join RJ and Dylan as they discuss each week's Seattle Kraken news and top stories from around the league. All right, RJ, when this podcast goes out tomorrow, Monday morning, we will be, you know, 36 hours-ish from the Kraken's first regular season game. Now, before we kind of get into talking about that game, we've got a couple quick announcements. The first of which is that you and I are going to be at that game. Yes, we are. Yeah, so that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to try to get as much coverage from that for everybody as possible. Hopefully do a YouTube video. Um, But kind of more importantly, uh, after that game, RJ, why don't you get into the second part of our announcements and and tell everybody about what's going to happen afterwards. Yes, after the game. So we are excited to introduce ECH Post Game Live. So after every single Kraken game this season, we are going to go live on our YouTube channel, giving our thoughts, analysis, everything on the game that just happened and kind of chatting about it with all of you. So obviously, Dill and I are big sports fans and you know the feeling after every game, the first thing I want to do is discuss it, right? You know, we know you'll have plenty of thoughts to share about every Kraken game, and so will we. So our post-game live is designed to kind of be your destination after the game to talk about Kraken hockey and kind of go through the game that just happened. So Dylan, you want to explain how they can get there, how that's all going to work on the logistics side? Yeah, so it, we're just going to be running it through YouTube Live. If you've joined us for like our, you know, our NHL entry draft coverage, we've done a couple Q and A's on there. It's really easy. If you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see us there. Um, RJ will be tweeting out a link to it at the end of every game. Um, it's it's going to be pretty easy to get to. But more importantly, because we're going to be doing it on YouTube, our YouTube channel is going to save that live broadcast. So. If, you know, game runs long, you don't quite feel like staying up that night, but you want to hear kind of our wrap up and analysis of the game and maybe some of the stuff that other people had questions about. It's going to be on our YouTube channel for you to watch, you know, the next morning while you're getting ready for work or having breakfast the next day on your lunch break, kind of whenever you want to watch it, it's going to be there for everybody. So that's kind of the benefit of us doing it on YouTube. Um, And I'm really excited for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm really excited that we're going to be able to share it with our community. You know, our last couple videos on YouTube have been getting a ton of comments, a lot of discussions going on in those. And, you know, I think for both of us, that's kind of one of these things we've wanted this whole time is to kind of form a a community with all of our, you know, listeners and all these other Kraken fans. Absolutely. And I've been at training camp and I've met some of you who have come up to me and wanted to talk about everything, all the goings on at training camp and covering it every day. And I think this is going to be a great chance um, for us to kind of share our thoughts with the community and hear their thoughts back and, you know, just have a uh, have a good discussion about every Kraken game. Yeah. So that's again, it's going to be happening at the end of every Kraken game. Um, that includes this Tuesday for the game in Vegas that me and RJ will be at. That one may not start as quickly post game just because we're going to have to walk back from the arena to the hotel room and get everything ready to go and, and hop on there. So I do understand we don't really know what time that's going to be. It'll also depend on how long the game goes. Um, but, you know, moving moving forward for other games, it'll usually start probably 10 or 15 minutes at the end of every game. So hopefully not too late for everybody. Um but, you know, kind of before we leave this upcoming Tuesday game, RJ, why don't we each give like one thought of or one thing we want to see from the Kraken when they face Vegas? Yeah, the thing I would like to see from the Kraken most when they face Vegas, and this is, you know, this is going to be a big step up from the games that they've just played. They've played three games against largely AHL filled rosters, and now they go to play Vegas, who is. You know, who was atop the standings last season. No team had more points than they did. The Avs, you know, got the top seed on a tiebreaker. But this is a cup contending NHL team, you know, ready to go for their first game. And I guess what I'd like to see most is 
the Kraken kind of maintain their defensive structure, not give up too much on the rush, and make sure to kind of keep their heads on a swivel and not get beat that way because Vegas is a fast team and they're capable of pretty much knocking you out of the game after the first 10 minutes if you're not careful. They can go up 3 nothing, 4 nothing early uh, if you're not uh, ready to play right away. So I want to see a good enough start. If it's 0-0 after 10 minutes, I'll be happy with that. Yeah, I mean, Vegas, they're, they're such a good team. They're fast, like you said. They're no slouch either when it comes to playing physically, right? I think they're one of the teams that can probably match the Kraken's physicality if they needed to, um, if that's the, the style of game they want to play. So that's kind of what I want to see Seattle do is is hopefully kind of set the tone, like like try to make it a physical game right out right away out of the gate, take away Vegas's speed, kind of draw them in, make them play the game you want to play. Um Otherwise, I just want to see kind of how the depth of the Kraken matches the depth of Vegas. Vegas is a really deep team, too, just like the Kraken. Um, So I'm really interested to see just kind of how all four lines roll through for the Kraken. Kind of, you know, we've talked about they don't necessarily have that one high-end scoring line, although they kind of do the Kraken. But, you know, I I want to see how some of those depth lines play, how the Tanev line goes out there and, and tries to, you know, are they going to be matched up against like Mark Stone and try to draw him into a physical game? Maybe try to tick him off a little bit, right? We've seen we've seen people get to him before. Him, you know what I mean? Kind of take him out of the game that way. I think stuff like that is what I'd like to see the Kraken do. That and you know, kind of keep up the momentum, especially on the power play from their last preseason game against Vancouver, which I'll, we'll go ahead and transition into now. So. It feels like a million years ago, this was back on Tuesday, that the Seattle Kraken beat the Vancouver Canucks 4 nothing in their final preseason game. Do you have any kind of takeaways from that last preseason game, RJ? Well, overall, it's the effort that I was hoping to see from a team of largely NHL players against a team of largely AHL players. That was the third game in a row that the Kraken had played where that was the situation. Uh, and I thought... They finally kind of got it together as far as scoring, which, uh, you know, they had trouble with that early on, too. It was something they kind of had to break through, uh, which they finally did, which is good. It's good to see them overcoming some adversity like that. Um, but overall, uh, you know, I think it was a fine effort, but it's it's a tough measuring stick, especially compared to the Vegas game coming up. Uh, but I, I thought they did a good job of sticking with it and then playing their game ultimately for throughout the whole 60 minutes. Yeah, it's a little rough. Uh, you know, they, they had that four minute power play basically to start the game and they weren't able to capitalize on that. And, you know, that kind of continued the theme all through the preseason of the power play. Not quite. I don't know if it's that it's not quite gelling or they're just not. I don't know. It's just not quite working. However, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, things changed later on in that game and they were able to get a couple power play goals. And what I liked about the power play in that game was that we finally kind of know what the plan is. And that plan is to have the defenseman who's, you know, at the point up by the blue line, they're going to be the trigger man, right? We saw Vince Dunn do that. Uh, Mark Giordano was doing that when he was out there on the power play. That's the trigger man. Guys on the the half boards on either side were moving the puck to them and then they were letting it rip. And I really like that strategy for this team that doesn't necessarily have that elite sniper. You can kind of set up Ovechkin or Stamco style right on one of the dots and he's just going to rip it. And no one can stop it. Um, but, but for this team, I really like that because, you know, one of two things happens when you do that. Well, I guess technically three. And I'll, I'll start with that third one. Um, Overall, it's a low-risk, high-reward style of play. The only risk involved is that the other team blocks the shot. And odds are, if they're blocking that shot, it's not going to like kind of lead to an odd man shorthanded rush. It'd be The odds of that are, are fairly small. Um, but, it, but they're there, so I'll go ahead and mention it. Otherwise, the two things that'll really happen from it is you have a shot going through you know, a crowd in front of the goalie, so the goalie's having to fight to see that puck. And, you know, if you can't see it, there's, you know, a decent chance that it sneaks by him. And the other thing that can happen is the goalie might stop it, especially on a low shot. Goalie's probably going to stop that by dropping down into butterfly, but it's going to bounce off those pads and create a pretty juicy rebound opportunity. And we saw that on the Ryan Donato power play goal in that game where 
Power play shot comes in, rebound spits out. He's right there to collect it and put it away. Saw that a couple games ago. Adam Larson threw a shot from the point up there. Jaden Schwartz was right there to put it away. So I'm really happy that, you know, with the Kraken style, if they continue to have that point man, you know, just launch slap shots from the point, get them through traffic, get them to the goalie. If they don't beat the goalie outright because of all the traffic, there's going to be a rebound opportunity and the Kraken, you know, They've got guys that are really good at getting behind the defense and being right there for those pucks. So I'm really uh, happy to see that, and I want to see that you know continue moving forward. I think that's going to be the key to getting this power play to work, especially early on in the season. But otherwise, RJ, I mean, Philip Grubauer did have a 38 save shutout. Now I know it wasn't against like you know the Vancouver Canucks total NHL lineup, but that's still impressive. Absolutely, and there were some high quality shots there too. And Grubauer just looked completely dialed in all game. And you can tell he's been feeling good. Um, we, we heard from him in the media scrum uh, twice uh, you know, over the past few days since that game. And he's just like, I feel good. I feel good. I'm ready to go. And uh, he talked about the importance, though, of seeing those high-quality shots. He said he felt that uh, it was important for him in the preseason to see a bunch of different looks out there, you know, and that includes some breakaways that includes some high danger chances because that's practice you want to get. And he was up to the task. He looked ready. Uh, and I just think he's ready for anything that, that Vegas can throw at him. Yeah. And, you know, I, I talked about it a little bit last week when we kind of broke down everyone on the roster and how they'd been playing through the preseason. I do think he's a goalie that the earlier he gets involved in the game, the better he is. I think, you know, we kind of saw in the very first preseason game against the Canucks. I know that was like a month ago, it feels like now. Um, but he didn't face a shot for about 10 minutes. And then it, it was just like this breakaway opportunity with the guy coming out of the box. And he, you know, he looked a little rusty there. Now, granted, it was the first preseason game. I'm sure that plays a role in it, too. But I do just kind of watching him over the years. I feel like the, the games where he's getting a high volume of shots are the games where he really stays in it and he really stays at his at his highest level. So um, and that, you know, probably won't be a problem playing the Vegas Golden Knights on Tuesday. But you mentioned, you know, hearing from Grubauer uh, at camp and stuff. RJ, why don't you fill us in on kind of the latest as far as, you know, training camp as it's, you know, closing out now, waivers, you know, the kind of final roster decisions, lines, if we have anything from, you know, Hackstall when it comes to that. Well, with training camp coming to an end, that final lineup is starting to solidify a bit. And, you know, it's not official and there's still a lot of question marks. I mean, the biggest caveat I have to give is we don't know what exactly the status of, of Kelly Yarncroak is going to be for that first game. He's in the NHL's COVID protocol. No updates beyond that. We don't know whether he has symptoms or not or how bad the symptoms are. We just don't know that. So I don't know if he's going to be there for game one. I would guess maybe not given, but, but you never know. So we'll start with that. Also, Yanni Gord's not going to be back for game one, but it looks like he might be back before Halloween. It wouldn't surprise me. He's looked that good. And they've been working him back into the lineup. Uh, Colin Blackwell, I certainly don't expect to see him for game one. We'll see when he comes back. We haven't heard updates on that. But as far as the lineup, I think we do have a pretty good idea of generally what the lineup is going to look like for opening night. Um, and I guess we'll start with the forwards and that top line of Schwartz, McCann, Everly. This has been a constant, pretty much all of training camp. Um, you know, Haxtell wouldn't confirm that it's you know top line. He doesn't like the labels, but I, I think we can all see it. You know, the chemistry between Schwartz and Everly and, and McCann just looks like he belongs there. So I'm not. We've talked about this in the past. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. We we know this is going to be the top line come come game one. Um, next, uh, from what we had today, was Johansson, Wenberg, and Donskoy which you have Wenberg there as the 2C before Gord's return, which we figured if McCann was up might be the case. Uh, he's been playing with Donskoy, and so Yarncroke has rotated onto there, so he might come back you know, once he returns, but uh, they've got uh, Johansson there. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of everything on that line. You've kind of got Wenberg, the playmaker, Donskoy, a creative guy, Johansson, also a creative guy. Um, but it, that's what I would guess we'd see for that line to start the season. Uh, third line is interesting. Donato, Geeky, and Appleton. I mean, you've got 
three guys who kind of play very different games. You've got Donato and his kind of offensive skill. You've got Geeky, who brings a lot of offensive skill, but he brings size. He's defensively responsible. He's a center. And then you've got Mason Appleton, who, you know, is just a wrecking ball out there. Um, he actually had a great net drive today. I got a good picture of it where he's just basically on top of the goalie as he's driving the net. I just saw him about to start. He had one hand on the stick and was leading it. I grabbed my phone to try and get the picture out uh, as soon as I could. Um, so Donato Geeky Appleton, I think that's one that has the potential to move around a bit, depending on how it all works with the pieces. Uh, and then you've got Tanev, Shane, and Bastion. This has been uh, another constant kind of throughout training camp where this is the energy line. This is the shutdown line. Uh, Brandon Tanev setting the tone. Uh, Nathan Bastion with his size, you know, he can hit guys. And then Riley Shan, who's fit in really well there. Uh, we'll see what happens when, when Gord or Blackwell come back. But uh, Shan's definitely earned his spot there for now. Uh, as for the D pairs, it's a little less certain. Um, they've moved around pretty much every day at training camp. It's hard to get a solid read on D pairs. But one thing they're trying now is uh, Giordano and Flurry together. And that's been together for the last three days or so. Um, and I actually like how that fits. Giordano is a more offensive guy. Hayden Flurry, more defensively responsible. And we talked about how the Susie flurry pairing didn't look very good because there was no one there to move the puck out of the zone. And I think putting Flurry with Giordano kind of remedies that situation. Uh, and it allows you to make the other uh, D pairings down the lineup work a little bit. You don't have to go with Susie and Flurry to start. Um, then you had Alexiak and uh, Larson. I, there, there's no weakness there on that. I mean, two big guys, Larson can move the puck, Alexiak can move the puck. Uh, I mean, there's, it's just a great D pair and a, and a solid three and four. Um, and then beyond that, it gets a lot more iffy. Uh, we've had Lausanne and Dunn. Uh, I don't know if Lausanne's going to make the opening lineup, but then you've got Susie Borgen, and that's how they've been playing it. So you'd think that Dunn and Susie would be the two guys who would start. Um, but I don't know if they're going to move that around, if they're going to move Alexiak down or up. That's, that's probably the part of the lineup I'm least sure about, and it'll be very interesting to see for game one uh, how they go with it. Um, so as for special teams, the power play units seem pretty set to me. Um, you've got that top unit with Jaden Schwartz playing net front. Uh, you've got Jared McCann on that left wing with his shot able to set up. It's not on his off wing, but he is still dangerous there with the shot. Uh, you've got, uh, Jordan Eberle playing the bumper position. We've talked about Eberle's struggles on the power play, um, but as the bumper, you don't need to produce a whole lot. You know, you can kind of facilitate moving the puck around. Um, and then you've got uh, Alex Wenberg on the right side. And I don't know about him in that spot, but he's got good vision to kind of move the puck from right to left. And it seems like that's something the power play has wanted to do on both units. Because what happens is if you move the puck from right to left, kind of across the middle of the ice, that forces the PK players to kind of condense down into the middle to try and stop that pass and opens up some room for your point man, who, as we talked about, is the trigger man. Uh, and so it frees up that point shot as you can have the guy on the left board just send it back to the point for that bomb. Uh, so that looks like the first power play unit, and that seems pretty set to me. Um, as for the second power play unit, they've got Ryan Donato playing net front now. We saw in the Vancouver game, he did a good job collecting the rebound in front and putting it into the net. I think that's a good spot for him. They had him on the right boards to start, uh, but Morgan Geeky has kind of taken over that position, and I think he's done really well. I wouldn't want to move him out of that spot. He's got such great vision to send the puck, again, from right to left, which is something they like to do. Uh, he's had so many good cross-ice passes there that have opened up room for the defense that I've seen in training camp at practice. Um, Donskoy in that bumper spot, I like him there. It's a good outlet for his creativity. Uh, right now they have uh, Johansson on the left side boards, although he's filling in because Yarncroak was there. So I think full-time Yarncroak is going to be there. They have Johansson filling in for now. And then Vince Dunn at the point. I mean, we saw what Vince Dunn can do in that Vancouver game. He had a couple goals. Uh, I 
was watching a shift of his in the offensive zone where he was just kind of moving all throughout the zone on a delayed penalty. And I'm just thinking, man, he is feeling it. You know, so I go to tweet, uh, I go to tweet the video of that shift. And by the time I go send the tweet, I see he's scored a goal. And then two minutes later, he scores another goal. Uh, so I think Vince Dunn's a great fit there. Um, but number one caveat, I guess for the whole lines and everything going forward um, at the media scrum today, Dave Haxtell was asked, well, what, you know, what are the lines going to be for the opener? And he kind of, you know, stopped us right there and just said, okay, you know, I've tried to be nice with you guys through the preseason and let you know exactly what the lineups are going to be. Uh, but that kind of ends here. Uh, you know, I'm just so you know, going forward for games, I'm not really going to be able to give you clear answers as far as who's playing where or what the lineup's going to be. So just so you know, that's that's what it's going to be. And he kind of laid down the law there. And so I think, uh, you know, we know we're not going to get clear answers going forward. Um, so I got to ask, though, what do you think about that, Dylan? Because I, I, I'm sensing you have an opinion on that. Yeah. Um, I, I hate when hockey coaches try to be like NFL coaches because the sports are very, very different. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on at the end of the podcast. But you know, RJ, you and I, we used to coach local youth roller hockey, right? We coached, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've both coached the same team. We've coached opposite teams. Uh, we, when we were coaching opposite teams at one point, um, you know, we shared a practice time and we shared the rink. So we knew what each other's teams were doing at any given time. Cause all you yeah. had to do was look across center. Right. Um, at any point, did you feel like that gave you a competitive advantage or a disadvantage? Like, not at all. No, I mean, I, you know, I could see everything you're doing. I could see, know that you could see everything I was doing, and I, you know, I didn't exactly hide what I was trying to do. Obviously, you know, squirt level rec hockey is a little different of a game, but I, I just think, if anything, it's more exploitable at that level because you have to be very clear about the code. You can only teach them one or two things. They don't have a whole lot of options as far as game plan. Uh, so yeah, no, I didn't, but I like <laughs> I like you bringing up that, uh, that analogy. Yeah, so... I, I understand wanting to be vague as far as injuries, letting, you know, not letting another team know if a certain player is going to be playing or not. Right. I totally understand that. But when it comes to lines, um, lines change all the time. It's an 82 game season. I guarantee you the, the lines for every team that starts on game one is completely different by the by, you know, game 82, whether it's due to injuries or shuffling things around. We see teams change their lines mid game just because they're trying to spark something, right? Like, I don't see that there's like this inherent advantage that a team might have because they know what your line is going to be. Now, maybe that's different for the Kraken game one just because of their unique scenario, right? Um, the fact that it's kind of, you know, this team that was just thrown together and in the course of a month they've had to figure everything out. So maybe there you have something. But, you know, for the most part in hockey, you're going to play. At, you know every other team in the league two to three times a year and again that's out of 82 games so you've got 80 some odd other games where you know you're you can't game plan for all of those when you're playing four games in seven days you can't game plan for every game you can't go in and say like okay this line we got to really shut them down at most you're going to say okay we're playing the Capitals. We got to shut down Alex Ovechkin or the Penguins, and you're like, okay, we got to shut down Crosby and Malkin. How are we going to do that? And you game plan kind of for the player more so than the line, because odds are, if the Penguins or the Capitals decide to change up who's on Ovechkin or Crosby's line, Ovechkin and Crosby aren't going to be changing how they play, right? Like the team yeah. would be stupid to make their superstar change the way they play, right? McDavid. It doesn't matter who he's playing with. You know, you got to slow him down. That's just the only way to win that game. So I, I don't like when the coaches get all like vague and secretive when it comes to lines, just because I don't really see the advantage to it. I don't think teams really need that information or use that information just because again, gonna we're gonna play columbus twice this year does it matter if columbus knows our lines or if we know columbus's lines not really right like you're gonna try to shut down patrick line because he's their top goal scorer like like that's the game plan so I, I don't know i think it's a little like you know it's just the way all professional sports are now where no one wants to give out any information and i'm not a huge fan of it but uh, well, especially now that we're media side, right? You know, <laughs> it's obviously yeah, I, I not... suppose we do have a bias at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We... I guess I'll throw that out there. Um, 
but as far as you know the lines and stuff that you were seeing in camp I, i'm totally cool with all the forward lines obviously i want to have yarn crow back and healthy as soon as possible the d pairs little concerning to me you know i like hayden flurry but i also don't like hayden flurry if you listen to the podcast last week right i like what he brings to the kraken i don't know that i want him necessarily on the top pairing seeing you know 24 minutes a night i don't know that that's where i necessarily want him and i'm not sure i want vince dunn all the way down on a third line right he's he's been arguably the kraken's best offensive player as far as creating opportunities scoring goals he had three goals this preseason so i want to see him kind of see more opportunity but i understand what haxtell seems to be doing where he's trying to pair you know a defensively responsible guy with somebody who can move the puck i just I, I, I don't want that philosophy to be the end-all, be-all. I, I think if at times you need offense, and I'm sure he will, because again, as I was just saying, they change pairings and lines all the time in games, right? If the Kraken are down by two or three goals, guess what? Vince Dunn's going to be out there a ton because they need yeah. to score goals, right? So um, I, I just, you know, some of those D pairings, they're a little odd to me. As you said, the Vince Dunn, Jeremy Lauzon thing, that's really odd to me. I I, yeah. I I don't think we're going to be seeing that Tuesday <laughs> night in Vegas. I just don't. But uh, yeah, I guess I guess we'll just have to wait and see what all of that looks like. So now there there are a couple more points though I want to hit on okay. uh, on the roster before we move on. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first is I, I feel like we need to do an obligatory Yanni Gord update. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mentioned that he's looking great. I wouldn't be surprised if he was back by Halloween. But I do want your opinion on this though. When he comes back, let's say he comes back, you know, after the end of the road trip, whatever it may be, where would you put him in the lineup? And I, w- I want to add uh, that during the last three days of training camp, he's been slotting in kind of on regular lines. Uh, the first day he filled in for Yarn Croak's spot, um, I believe it was with, or I mean, he was with Geeky and Appleton. Donato was up. But anyway, he was with Geeky and Appleton playing left wing. And then the next day he moved up to that first line center spot. He was centering Schwartz and Everly. So kind of those are the two places they had him in. And then today he was splitting time with uh, Geeky between Donato and Appleton uh, as a center, but he wasn't playing all the line rushes. It was mostly Geeky. And then he was just kind of taking some reps in there. But given that, where would you like to see him slot in when he comes back? Yeah. So I know he's the most accomplished center on this team as far as, you know, everyone's careers before getting to Seattle. I understand the want to put him with Schwartz and Eberle on the top line. I say, let's see how McCann does. They've looked pretty good through the preseason in camp. I think if they can come out and McCann looks well and that line is scoring goals and everything's good, I say don't mess with it. If if that's different, then yeah, I guess go ahead and give it a shot because I, I do feel that Eberle and Schwartz have better chemistry than either of them have with McCann himself even though McCann has been playing well up there then you know go ahead put Yanni Gord in there see what happens otherwise I really like him working with guys like Morgan Geeky Um, I think he'd be really effective with somebody like uh, Donskoy just because I feel like Yanni Gord is a crafty player he's a creative player that's what all these kind of great two-way centers have to be right because they're in a you know they're they're in a more reactionary position they're trying to see what the other team's doing and then they're going to come up with a way to stop that on the spot and so I, I feel like offensively he's also like that uh you know just watching him in tampa bay the last couple of years and so i i, I want to see him more with guys like geeky certainly with somebody like don Skoy, just to see kind of how that goes. I think Marcus Johansson would be really good with him too, just because of the energy and, and just that, that overall, I, I don't know, it's it, that, that special something that they both seem to play with. Uh, I think that could be a good matchup, but I, I want to see him with the more creative players. And I know it might be, you know, stereotypical just to be like, okay, you're going to play like on the third line and, and shut down the other team whenever we need you to, right? Because that's what he did in Tampa. And I think we all know he's better than just being a shutdown center. But I think when it comes to making him effective offensively and, and you know, kind of putting on a show, so to speak, I, I want to see him with some of the creative wingers and, and creative players that this Kraken team has. Yeah, I agree. I think it would be good to see him with some of the creative players. I think the issue comes down to, well, how deep do you want to be at center? And it's, I guess, a great problem 
you know, quote unquote problem to have uh, for the Kraken because if you keep McCann at center and then Gord center somewhere in there, then you've got Wenberg and you've got all of a sudden Morgan Geeky as your fourth line center. And I know they see him as better than a fourth line center, um, but you're you're looking really deep at center. Uh, and I like that for maybe a, a playoff series. I mean, that's going to be dangerous if they get there. Um, but yeah, moving McCann to wing does allow you to, I guess, get more ice time for, say, a Morgan Geeky or, a, or an Alex Wenberg. Um, but yeah, if, it, it'll be interesting to see how McCann does with Schwartz and Everly because, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't mess with it. If they're doing well, leave it be and, and kind of throw Gord wherever you feel like you could use some help in the lineup. And so the last thing I want to cover uh, is the discussion of captain. So they rotated three alternate captains throughout the preseason, and it was, I think it was six or seven different guys who wore an A at some point. I think Giordano uh, wore it the most. And that still hasn't been decided yet. We asked Haxtell about that today. He said they're going to have a meeting about it today and get it all finalized tomorrow by the time uh, they decide to head out to Vegas. So, Dylan... I'm going to put you in Haxtell's shoes right here. Who, what are you going with this leadership group? Do you name a captain at this point? Do you just have three alternates? Who are they? Let's say you. Oh, I'd, I'd talk to the guys I, and I'd, and I'd see, do they want a captain? Do they feel like that's something the team needs or do they want kind of that shared responsibility amongst everybody given the unique circumstances? Um, in the scenario that they kind of, you know, seem like they want a captain uh, i obviously i ask mark giordano first i think you know obviously he was captain for a long time in calgary he's looked you know very much like he's the leader out there when everyone's on the ice um i like him in that position i think he can represent a team very very well in you know any way that a captain would need to so if i'm naming a captain if 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 that's what the guys want I'm going Mark Giordano. If they don't, um, then yeah, I I probably go with a rotating thing, just just because I think that's the appropriate thing to do. I, I never like it when a team doesn't have a captain, but then they'll just like lock into like two guys that are like, well, they're like co-captains or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd rotate it amongst some of the guys that we've seen. I think Giordano, obviously, Adam Larson's been wearing an A a lot, and I like that from him. I don't know what he's like behind the scenes, but you know, when he's out on the ice, he seems more of a lead by example kind of guy than a, a vocal leader on the bench and stuff like that. I think Jamie Alexiak's probably ready to, t- to step up and take a leadership role, especially, you know, they bring him in in the expansion draft. They immediately sign him to a contract extension. The, the team seems very committed to him and he seems very committed to the team. So I think that's kind of an appropriate next step there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, but I'd also rotate in maybe some other guys, a Jaden Schwartz, obviously that guy's got leadership for days. Um, yeah, that's the name I was looking ice. for. Yeah, there you go. So uh, that's that's what I would do. But I, I think ultimately I would talk with the team, try to get a sense of what, what it is that they want to go with. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's got to be a decision from kind of in that locker room and, and how they want to be led. And, you know, obviously we can't see the, you know, the details of that, you know, well behind the scenes. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with tomorrow. Yeah, so that's definitely going to be something that, you know, we'll let you guys all know about once we know. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to see what decision they go. Gut feel for me, I'm, I'm thinking they're going to go no captain. What about you? I agree. I think, and and it would be a really easy decision, too, to, if you want to rotate them especially. You can name five or six alternates and just kind of, you got all your bases covered. No one's snubbed. It's just, you know, spread out leadership groups. So I think that's what we're going to see. Agreed, agreed. All right, so for our final segment, RJ, um, I want to talk about injuries. This past week in the NHL, we saw two injuries in you know some of the final preseason games that are being played. Uh, Zach Cassian of the Edmonton Oilers had a terrible injury, um, kind of a fight gone wrong in which you know his helmet had been knocked off during the fight. He fell, hit his head on the ice. He was unconscious, looked really nasty, really scary. He's out for you know an undetermined amount of time at this point. Um, It was just a really bad situation. Then we saw Alex Ovechkin get hurt in the Capitals' final preseason game against the Flyers. He goes in to check Travis Konechny, and I, you know, 
I don't know exactly what happened, but he comes, you know, he lays on the ice, kind of holds around his knee area, doesn't put any weight or pressure on that leg, skates off the ice straight back to the locker room. Now, the, the Capitals have since said that, you know, he's he's day to day. So and and they've made him kind of you know questionable for the season opener. So I'm guessing then that it's not too bad. Uh, it seemed bad, but hopefully you know it's just like a, a bruise or something, and uh, he was able to avoid anything serious. But it it got me thinking, you know, kind of two things, and and there's the obvious questions of why is Zach Cassian fighting in a preseason game? Right. No one should be fighting in a preseason game, especially somebody like him who's guaranteed a roster spot. This isn't like the old days where it was like, oh, I got to show that I can you know, provide something to this team in a depth role or something. Right. That doesn't really apply there. And, you know, why was Ovechkin playing at all in a preseason game? I, I don't think he probably needs it. Um, so I have questions there, but I'm going to ignore those kind of obvious questions because I want to talk about something else. You and I both know that for some of our listeners and stuff, this is the, the Kraken coming to Seattle is, is their first exposure to hockey. And it's very much that way for my 92-year-old grandfather who lives out in Gig Harbor. Hey, Ed. Um, he started watching for the first time in his life. Now, he's been a football fan forever. You and him are both USC alumni. Uh, fight on. Um, but so he's no stranger to sports, but hockey is obviously a lot different than, let's say, football. So, you know, he's been asking me a lot of questions and stuff, and it's been kind of fun to teach him the game uh, as you know the, the preseason games have been going on and stuff like that. The other day, though, comes up and he asks, hockey's pretty physical. Do these guys get hurt a lot? And mm-hmm. I kind of like paused for a second. I was like, I mean, they get hurt, but but not really like they're, they're, they get hurt, but not injured. Right. They're not we don't see some of the stuff that we see in, say, the NFL where guys will miss multiple games, which is really a multiple week injury because the NFL is only playing once a week. NHL, we're only seeing, you know, over the course of a year, maybe two guys per roster that'll have like a four to six week injury. Right. You'll you'll see guys miss games here or there. But again, they're playing far more frequently than the NFL. Um, So. It got me thinking about, you know, why do hockey players, you know, seemingly get hurt a lot less than NFL players when it's both, you know, they're both really physical sports. So before I get into that, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you have, you know, any thoughts or ideas as to why that might be? Well, uh, I mean, let me think about that. Uh, (laughs) You know, I I suppose it is different. uh, You know, there are a number of differences between football and and hockey. And I, I guess the first place my mind goes is, uh, the, the type of contact, um, you know, in football, in, you know, I hesitate to say that there's there's more kind of random contact because hockey is a very, you know, random sport as far as the, the motions of the contact you get. Uh, but in, it feels like in football, there's more, I guess, piles of bodies, you know, places you can just step a wrong way and, and accidental collisions and things like that. Where in hockey, you certainly get that, but it feels like the, it's more of a one-on-one type of situation uh, most of the time where you have, you know, a player and then someone who's defending him, you have a lot of pileups. Um, but most of the time you have more of a one-on-one type situation. Let me think, I guess, you know, the, the padding being different in football, you've just got the shoulder pads and not a whole lot beyond that in the helmet, obviously. And in hockey, you've kind of got head to toe padding. And I guess that helps with blocking shots and something like that. You know, you, you couldn't play hockey with football padding because you block a shot and it, that's it. But um, I don't know. I'm curious. What do you think? Yeah. What do you think it is, Dill? And I, I, you've thought about it. Uh, tell me what you think. Yeah. So I came up with kind of two main reasons that I could think of as to why football players will sustain kind of multiple weak injuries that hockey players might not. And you kind of touched on one of them when you said that the, the type of contact is different. Now, in hockey, obviously, you can ice skate a lot faster than anybody can run. So any collision in hockey is a much uh rougher collision right it's you know guys that are going close to 30 miles an hour hitting each other rather than 20 right that's a big difference a 40 mile an hour car crash is a lot different than a 60 mile an hour car crash Um, but when it comes to hockey most of the time guys are getting hit kind of up high right both players are standing up you don't see you know things like in football where both players are getting really really low and like kind of throwing their heads out there frontwards and 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 taking a hit no you see things more like a standard not like not like a Rob Blake hip check where he's sending somebody into you know 
the the seats or something like that but you see more you know hip checks guys you know they're, they're pressing them up against boards so there's something to keep them up right to keep them from going right. down and you know really when we do see the the rougher more significant injuries in hockey usually it involves a player going to the ice that's when guys will go you know crash into the boards a leg will get bent awkwardly they'll crash into the net right we all have you know that image of Stamkos's leg breaking cracking into that net that will never Don't leave i know i know um so that's that's kind of the first thing i thought of was in hockey you're getting hit up high you're staying standing up so yeah it hurts but there's nothing that can that can twist your leg in a funny way, the way there is in, in football where a guy's tackling you and trying to wrap you up and stuff like that. And the other thing is, and if you're an NFL fan, you know, this is a big deal. There are all of the like ligament injuries, especially in the knee area, ACL, MCL, all that kind of stuff doesn't happen as much in hockey because just the motion that you're doing, right? The, the skating motion is a lot more forgiving on your muscles and on your ligaments than a football motion. And a lot of times for those no contact ligament injuries, it's because a player is trying to be too explosive all at once and the ligament just can't handle it. So it just gives it's too much force that the player's, you know, leg is applying to it. And usually that comes from lateral movements, right? A running back plants his foot. He's trying to make a cut and trying to keep as all that momentum he has from running forward and transition it now basically in a 90 degree angle to go a different direction. And his knee just gives out. That, that can't happen in hockey, right? You can't just stop on a dime and try to move laterally in hockey. I guess you can, but you're going to be in for a world of hurt and your your knee will for surely give out, right? It's, it's more of you cross over, right? You're taking that momentum and you're applying it differently. And so you can keep it going in a different way. And so I think that's what kind of keeps hockey players from having those same kinds of injuries that NFL players have, or even, you know, we see that in baseball players or basketball players, right? A lot of times when NBA players get hurt, their ligaments get hurt in their knees and stuff. It's because they try to, yeah, again, make a lateral move real quick, or maybe they jump, they come down hard in the paint, right? Somebody lands on top of them, much like in the NFL, and that's where you get issues. Nobody's jumping up and down in hockey, right? Again, if you, yeah. if you are, you're probably doing something wrong. So, <laughs> um, so those are just kind of the two things I thought of, but it was just interesting because that's not a question I would have ever thought of, but because my grandfather's coming to the sport, only knowing you know, football, knowing nothing about hockey. I just thought it was an interesting question to bring up because I do know that, you know, a, a decent amount of our of our listeners are also fairly new to hockey. So I just thought I'd I'd throw that out there for anybody. All right, RJ. So that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Emerald City Hockey Podcast. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining in and listening. If you're in Vegas, reach out to us on social media. If you're in Vegas for that game on Tuesday night, we'd love to you know, meet up with you guys if that's possible. Uh, we'll try to make that work on our end. Let us know if you're there. And you know, just another reminder, after every Kraken game this year, we'll be doing you know, a post-game live show right here on YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if you're listening to this podcast through you know, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anything like that, Emerald City Hockey is the YouTube channel. Make sure to come check us out for those. We will be tweeting links every game to you know make it easy. You can just slide right in and join us, ask questions, hang out with everybody. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a really fun time. And you know, for the last time, you get to say, you know, Kraken games are here, right? Like yes, <laughs> yeah, it's finally really really becoming real and it counts i i know it's, it's it's funny it feels like i keep saying that like for since july right it's like oh it's it's finally here it's real but it, but now it really really is right and the only place to go from here is i guess the playoffs and we'll you know come back around to that come you know april may of next year but uh, that's going to do it for us this week thanks everybody for stopping by and uh, we'll see you next time mm-hmm.